In the summer of 2015, Marvel ended Phase 2 with the release of their 12th film, Ant-Man. Unlike most previous Marvel movies up till then, not a lot of casual fans were looking forward to Ant-Man. Worse yet, quite a few of the hardcore fans were actually dreading it, and many believed Ant-Man was destined to become Marvel Studios' first film to flop. As it turned out, Ant-Man was met with positive reviews, and it did financially well enough to justify its 2018 sequel, Ant-Man and the Wasp. Where the original Ant-Man movie really stands out compared to the movies that came both before and after was the troubled production which saw the movie delayed time and again for the better part of a decade, as well as the departure of its original director, Edgar Wright. In this video, we will look back at the origins of Ant-Man, the character's troubled path to the silver screen, and why original director Edgar Wright had to go. Tales to Astonish was an anthology comic that initially ran for 101 issues between 1959 and 1968. For the most part, it was a series that was simply a showcase for artists and writers to hone their craft. Comic legends such as Steve Ditko, Don Heck, Chris Rule, and Paul Reinman all worked on stories in it at one point or another. By and large, Tales to Astonish was a fairly unremarkable title up until January 1962's issue 27, titled The Man in the Ant Hill. It was written by the then 40-year-old editor-in-chief, Stanley Martin Lieber, who was known by the more familiar pseudonym Stan Lee. He was assisted by his brother Larry, as well as comic book legend Jack Kirby. Inspired by the 1957 film The Incredible Shrinking Man, the story itself is rather simplistic. A scientist named Hank Pym discovers a way to shrink a human being, accidentally shrinks himself, and has to escape from an anthill. He was never written to be a recurring character. In fact, issue 28 moved on to introducing another obscure character in Gorilla Man. However, audiences connected with Hank Pym and made his issue one of the best-selling issues of Tales to Astonish. The strong sales figures of the issue made Stan Lee consider bringing Hank back as a full-time superhero. In issue 35, Hank Pym returned, this time with a red superhero outfit and other later hallmarks of the character like controlling ants. A year later, the world would be introduced to Ant-Man's eventual girlfriend, Janet Van Dyne, aka The Wasp a popular character in her own right. Most noteworthy, the pair would be among the original founders of the Avengers in the landmark Avengers issue number one. Over the following years, the Ant-Man stories would be expanded to include further allies as well as villains like Yellowjacket and alter egos like Giant Man and Goliath, and down the line, other Ant-Man in Scott Lang and Eric O'Grady. The attempts to create an Ant-Man feature film can be traced all the way back to the late 1980s, when Stan Lee pitched the idea of an Ant-Man movie to then-Marvel Comics owner New World Pictures. The film made it into pre-production, but it died a quiet death due to rival film company Walt Disney Pictures developing the 1989 film Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, which New World deemed too similar in concept. Incidentally, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids was helmed by Joe Johnston, who years later would go on to direct Captain America the First Avenger for Marvel Studios. As for Ant-Man, there would be no further attempts at bringing the character to the screen until the turn of the century. In the year 2000, radio personality and self-proclaimed king of all media Howard Stern, fresh off the success of his film Private Parts, wanted to greatly expand his feature film career. Reportedly a huge Ant-Man fan, he attempted to purchase the film rights from Marvel, but they were not able to reach an agreement. In May of the same year, then-president and CEO of Marvel, Avi Arad, made a deal with Artisan Entertainment to co-produce and distribute a total of 15 superhero projects, which in addition to Ant-Man also included a Captain America film and a Thor TV series. By 2003, however, very little progress had been made on any of these projects. That's when a young filmmaker named Edgar Wright and his good friend Joe Cornish approached Artisan and wrote a treatment for the film. Edgar Wright, who at the time was best known for creating the cult classic British television series Spaced, was fairly unknown in the United States, but he was becoming quite popular in his native England. His treatment was to focus on Scott Lang, the second Ant-Man, due to Wright wanting the story to invoke the style of writer Elmore Leonard. Wright claims that his treatment never made it to Marvel, because Artisan wanted to be more of a family thing. He briefly gave up on the project and shifted his focus to his planned next film, Shaun of the Dead, a satirical horror comedy which would go on to earn him great critical acclaim and recognition. Following his success with Shaun of the Dead, Wright pitched the idea of an Ant-Man film again, this time to the head of the newly formed Marvel Studios, Kevin Feige. Wright's pitch must have impressed Feige, as at the 2006 San Diego Comic-Con, during the Marvel Studios' first ever panel, they announced a slate of films which included an Edgar Wright-directed Ant-Man. During the panel, Wright explained that this film would not be a spoof of superhero films, but a legitimate action adventure. The film would feature both Ant-Men, Hank Pym and Scott Lang, though mostly Lang. 
As of February 2007, Wright explained that the film was in a holding pattern while the script was being revised and that he was studying nanotechnology to make sure that the science was accurate. During this period, he also directed the comedy Hot Fuzz, which much like Shaun of the Dead, was a hit both critically and financially. 2008 saw Wright hand in his first draft of Ant-Man and commence writing his second draft. That same year, Marvel released its first feature film, Jon Favreau's Iron Man, which would kickstart what would become the Marvel Cinematic Universe, as well as the second movie in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, The Incredible Hulk. With Ant-Man though, progress was slow. In May of 2010, Stan Lee tweeted that Marvel were prepping the film, and that he had already met with Wright and discussed writing the characters, despite Wright at this time still working on Scott Pilgrim vs. The World. Wright later noted that there wasn't a schedule yet for the film. He stated, because that character isn't one of their biggest properties, it's not like a tentpole deadline. It's more like me and Kevin saying, let's make a really good script. We've always agreed on that. Let's make a good script that works. That's all about a great genre film, and that isn't necessarily relying on anything else. At the 2010 San Diego Comic-Con, Edgar Wright made quite a surprising announcement. At the Marvel panel, he told the world that Ant-Man would not be a part of the upcoming Avengers movie despite the character having always been a key member. He said, It didn't work with the kind of angle that we were going to do with the origin that I'd written. At this point in time, Wright still had yet to complete a second draft of the script, and he would spend the rest of the year completing Scott Pilgrim vs. The World, which was released in August of 2010. While the film was a hit with fans and critics, it bombed at the box office. After its release, Wright returned to making Ant-Man, a film he had been developing on and off for the better part of five years, with very little to show for it. This time, however, there were no other projects competing for his attention. Wright finally finished the second draft of his Ant-Man script in April 2011 and turned in a third draft just before Comic-Con. In early May of 2012, Wright tweeted a pictogram of the titular hero and claimed the movie was the closest it had ever been to being filmed in almost a decade. Audiences, however, weren't all that interested in the adventures of Ant-Man just then. For that very month, The Avengers was released. The film was a smash hit with fans and critics alike, and an absolute juggernaut at the box office. Against this backdrop, audiences quickly forgot that Ant-Man was supposed to be a founding member of the group. Nonetheless, Wright continued to work on the project, and by June, he had shot a reel of footage that was intended to showcase the look and tone of the film. This footage was screened at the Marvel panel at Comic-Con. All the while, Wright continued to assure the audience that Ant-Man was still getting made. The test footage was very well received, with many in attendance noting that it shared a tone similar to Wright's hot fuzz. Marvel were apparently impressed as well, as in October, Disney finally gave Ant-Man a release date. It was scheduled to arrive in theaters November 6, 2015, a date that was shared with the James Bond film Spectre. In January of 2013, Kevin Feige stated that Ant-Man would be the first film in Phase 3 of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. In spring of 2013, word got out that Kevin Feige had demanded the script be slightly revised in order to better fit the Marvel Cinematic Universe. The movie had been conceived and written as a Phase 1 film, but by then the movie was intended to kickstart Phase 3, so a rewrite was needed to bring the story up to speed. In July of that year, Edgar Wright and Joe Cornish turned in their final draft of the script and then proceeded to ask Kevin Feige to delay production for a few more months. Wright wanted the additional time to finish another pet project that had come his way, The World's End. As producer on it, completing it was a matter of some urgency, and Wright's personal friend, producer Eric Fellner, was succumbing to cancer. Feige agreed, and The World's End would prove to be yet another box office hit for Wright, but the price was pushing back Ant-Man even further. In August of 2013, director Joss Whedon explained that there would be no references to Ant-Man in the upcoming film Avengers Age of Ultron. This was another massive change, as Ant-Man was Ultron's creator in the comics, but there was little in the way of outcry. Pre-production on Ant-Man finally began in October of 2013, while Disney pushed the movie's release date back to July of 2015, where it would now conclude Phase 2 instead of kicking off Phase 3. By October of 2013, rumors were swirling about who would play Scott Lang, and it seemed to come down to two candidates, Paul Rudd of the 40-year-old Virgin fame and Joseph Gordon-Levitt of Inception. Rudd rapidly became the frontrunner and was eventually cast as Scott Lang. Meanwhile, Kevin Feige continued to tease and add details about the film, such as the film being largely a heist movie and that two Ant-Men were going to be featured. In January 2014, they had found their Hank Pym in the form of Michael Douglas, and the rest of the cast quickly followed in the coming months. This included Evangeline Lilly, Patrick Wilson, Corey Stoll, Matt Gerald, and Michael Pena. From the outside, everything seemed to be progressing nicely. Behind the scenes, however, tensions were rising.
By March of 2014, rumors started to spread that not all was well on the set of Ant-Man. Kevin Feige demanded ever more script revisions, and at this time, Wright, who was reportedly working on a fifth draft of the script, was quite unhappy with the direction the film was taking. He was also tasked with writing a post credit scene for Avengers Age of Ultron, which was meant to tie directly into Ant-Man. In April of 2014, mere weeks away from filming and with sets already built, Feige reportedly informed Wright that the studio had ordered another draft of the script, one which neither Wright himself nor his writing partner Joe Cornish would have any hand in developing. Despite no longer having any control over the rewrites, Wright reluctantly stayed on board a while longer. On May 22nd, the script was handed to Edgar Wright, who reportedly was furious with the changes. The next day, he met with the heads of Marvel and announced he would be leaving the project. Marvel and Wright told the public he was leaving the project due to differences in their vision of the film. Wright later added that, I wanted to make a Marvel movie, but I don't think they really wanted to make an Edgar Wright movie. In suddenly becoming a director for hire on it, you're sort of less emotionally invested and you start to wonder why you're there really. Feige would later recall that, we sat around the table and we realized it was not working. A part of me wishes we could have figured that out in the eight years we were working on it. But better for us and for Edgar that we figured it out then and not move it through production. The Marvel movies are very collaborative and I think they are more collaborative than what he had been used to and I totally respect that. Within the week, Marvel was in talks with Anchorman director Adam McKay to direct the film with the script Marvel had written. He declined, though he did contribute to the script. As Marvel scrambled to find a new director, a large chunk of Wright's team left the project, including among them cinematographer Bill Pope, who previously worked on Scott Pilgrim vs. the World and The World's End for Wright, and composer Stephen Price, best known for his Academy Award-winning work on the film Gravity. Other directors were considered for the job, including David Wayne, Rawson Thurber, and Michael Dowes. The list also included Zombieland and future Sony Venom director Ruben Fleischer. On June 7th, 2014, Marvel Studios announced that Yes Man director Peyton Reed would take over the helm of Ant-Man. Despite no longer being involved with the movie, Edgar Wright would receive an honorary executive producer credit. On July 15th, 2014, Kevin Feige stated that the film was very much in the spirit of what Edgar's original pitch was, and that the movie is in as good a shape as it's ever been right now. Edgar Wright fans, however, worried that the movie had been toned down from his original version, which Feige tried to dispel. On July 25th, 2014, more bad news struck, as Patrick Wilson, Matt Gerald, as well as other actors had to drop out due to the delay in filming and changing directors had caused. This had happened in the middle of Comic-Con, which did very little to further Ant-Man's PR problems. The following day at the Marvel panel, Feige revealed that Evangeline Lilly would be playing Hope Van Dyne, Hank Pym's daughter. Fans got even more riled up on July 27th, 2014, when word got out that Janet Van Dyne, Hank Pym's wife, whose relationship is a key aspect to his character, would barely be featured in the film. In early August, writers Gabriel Ferrari and Andrew Barr, plus script doctor Eric Pearson, briefly joined the project to make some final revisions to the script. On August 18th, 2014, shooting finally commenced on Ant-Man. After more than a decade in various stages of development, Ant-Man opened on June 29th of 2015. The movie was a hit with critics, garnering 82% on Rotten Tomatoes with a 6.8 average. From a box office standpoint, the film was a success relative to its budget, but not a massive one compared to previous Marvel films. By the time the dust had settled, Ant-Man grossed $180 million domestically and $339 million internationally for a worldwide total of $519 million against a budget of $142 million. As it stands, Ant-Man is the second lowest grossing film in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, just slightly above 2008's The Incredible Hulk. Paul Rudd's performance and the special effects were singled out as standouts, while the smaller scale of the film compared to previous Marvel offerings, as well as a lackluster villain, and some forced MCU-related scenes were subject of criticism. The script itself became a point of contention, with certain aspects likely being close to Edgar Wright's vision, and others being more from Marvel's various rewrites. Fans of the character were for the most part accepting of the film, happy to have even gotten an Ant-Man movie, while Edgar Wright's fans were less accepting of the fact that he wasn't the one to direct it. Outside of being an overall fun movie, Ant-Man will always be remembered as the movie Edgar Wright didn't direct, much to the dismay of his fans. We will never know how an Edgar Wright directed Ant-Man might have been, or how it would have compared to the Peyton Reed movie we ended up getting. What we do know is that whatever Edgar Wright was planning, it would have not fit where the MCU was at the time, and that is why he had to go. While each movie within a cinematic universe has to work on their own, they also have to fit seamlessly within the larger tapestry of the MCU. 
James Gunn, Taika Waititi, and Ryan Coogler have all shown that unique and personal movies can be made within the MCU, provided they fit within the producer-mandated confines of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. That is the only way movies such as Avengers Infinity War can be planned and made. But the price to pay for that is that auteur-driven movies made by directors who won't compromise such as Edgar Wright's Ant-Man have to be sacrificed. Is that the price you are willing to pay for a cohesive cinematic universe? Let us know your thoughts in the comments. If you like this video, then please click the subscribe button. And don't forget to click the bell icon to be notified for all the latest uploaded content. Due to recent changes to YouTube's monetization policies, we'd also like to ask you to please consider supporting Midnight's Edge and its sister channel Midnight's Edge After Dark through Patreon. As thanks for their support, patrons will receive early notifications of mini documentaries, special behind the scenes making of the Edge videos, bloopers, outtakes, lost episodes, and more. You can support the channel for as little as $1 a month. Be sure to check back for news and analysis on the corporate politics behind your favorite genre movies, as well as updates and discussion here at Midnight's Edge.